Stephen, welcome to Training Magazine Network. We're delighted to turn things over to you now. Well, thanks so much for having us. And by the way, thank you again to everyone for joining. Um, uh, as Gary mentioned, we tried to bring a bunch of people together to talk through a number of point of views as to why game-based training and uh, you know how, how to do it so effectively in, in your organization. So um, we're going to do a lot of sharing of best practices and, and good stories with one another. Um, uh, really, the, the purpose, just trying to advance to the next slide, um, uh, let me just see if we can, there we go. Um, in this webinar, we will be doing um, really a few things. We're going to you know, talk about the importance of games. We're going to talk with Harry, uh, certainly about what, what Sony's uh, been thinking about in the L&D space and um, how they've entered that, that space with Jeopardy. And, and obviously, this is, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game that a lot of people uh, have familiarity with and, and have been using historically. And so what's, what's new? Um, and then we're going to talk with folks over at uh, Chest and Comcast about best practices and where they're using games overall. Um, just a few quick uh, intro slides. So the game agency is uh, 13 years old and uh, really been focusing uh, over, over the years on both creating custom training uh, games as well as building out a turnkey solution in the form of the training arcade. Um, people ask why games and you know ultimately it comes down to a few things it comes down to thinking about um, our audience uh, our learners who are all incredibly distracted um, in many cases they're quite bored uh, they're just not stimulated and they want feedback and, and the reality is that games provides uh, a, a, a venue to engage them on a much deeper level and turn their training from a very passive experience into potentially a much more active experience um, uh, one of the things that people ask us often is, uh, I, I, or we hear often is, I want to use gamification or I want to use games. And I think it's always important to stop and make sure that everyone's on the same page as to what is the difference between those two things. So we, we, we often talk about, well, game-based training or using games themselves is it's a controlled environment. It is something that you're going to actually engage with. Um, and practice with and dive into. It's going to, uh, it comes in many shapes and sizes, and we'll talk about a number of those, um, but it's something you're going to play, right? Versus gamification, which is taking some of the foundations of games, so, you know, the goals or challenges, progress, points, badges, leaderboards, rewards, and applying it to your everyday world. And, and we can certainly talk about that in more detail, but for the most part, today we're going to be talking about game based training. Um, one of the things we will be talking about uh, specifically with, with each of the presenters today is a tool called the Training Arcade. Uh, one of the things we found looking at the market uh, a few years ago was that, and, and it's actually um, really interesting if you look at the poll that people were taking uh, just a few minutes ago, I was looking before we started, um, there's a pretty much even distribution of people who are creating games for the most part today using Captivate, Storyline, um, Lectora, the, the, the authoring tools overall. And um, there are some game mechanics in there. Uh, there's some quiz mechanics in there. Uh, but the reality is, is that most of the time when people are creating games in those environments, you're talking about hours and hours and hours. Um, we've seen, we've seen uh, stats of saying upwards of 90 hours to create a really compelling game. And there are very few of us who are on this call that have that amount of time. So one of the things that we uh, really focused on was making sure that everyone has an opportunity to use a variety of game mechanics uh, without coding necessary and with much less time. So we created the Training Arcade uh, about two years ago with that in mind. Um, really excited about the fact that uh, just about a year ago, uh, we, we formalized a partnership with uh, Sony uh, and uh, added Jeopardy to the training arcade. Uh, it, this is the only official Jeopardy training game in the world, and um, we're really proud of that. And we worked hand in hand with, uh, with, with Sony to, to build it. And we're going to talk about that in more detail. Um, we also are extremely excited. One of the things we were asked very early on was, uh, can we add in an instructor mode that is really uh, going to bring it to life in the classroom? And we've just done that. And uh, we certainly would love, love anyone who's not familiar with that to, to, to give it a try. So uh, without further ado, I, I want to um, start with uh, Harry Friedman. I'm so excited. 
our, our companies have been working together now, as I mentioned, for over a year. And uh, Harry obviously is uh, really, really, really the brains and the creative behind this property as the executive producer, um, both for Jeopardy as well as Wheel of Fortune. Um, and it's been a real pleasure working with him and his team to take this from the TV environment um, into uh, the e-learning and certainly um, a di digital environment. Uh, so, Harry, I, I, as, as discussed, I have a bunch of questions I'm hoping you and I can go through. Sure. Um, you know, the, and the first one is really to talk about uh, what makes Jeopardy so successful, right? I mean, it's been 36 years. It is America's favorite show. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, well, I, thank you, and, I, and I'm delighted to be with you guys today. Uh, I think one of the reasons the show's been so successful uh, is right there in the center of that photo, and it and it's Alex. Um, I, I don't think his contribution. Um, uh, I don't think we would be where we are today without Alex. He's been the perfect host for this game. Um, the game itself is really ridiculously simple, and it hasn't honestly changed very much since it was first introduced um, to NB on NBC Daytime in 1964. It's basically categories, clues, and you respond in the form of a question. And in every episode, you have 61 opportunities to, to respond and um, maybe know something that the contestants don't, or maybe walk away having learned something, but it's what we like, we like to say that it is um, reliable but never predictable. Yeah, well that, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, there's, uh, and this is actually, uh, my, my next question is, t if you can talk about the parallels certainly between the success of the um, television show as well as what makes successful training initiatives, right? Um, and, and, and we'll get certainly further into, um, Trey, I saw a, a comment that you made talking about PowerPoint Jeopardy versus uh, maybe, maybe a more interactive experience. So we'll certainly get there with um, Harry because I think that's a really important point. But, but maybe we can start by just talking about the, the parlay of television, uh, or sorry, the comparison between what makes television shows successful and what makes training initiatives successful from your point of view. Well, when you uh, launch a TV show, if you're lucky, it will build an audience. The, that audience will become uh, loyal. Uh, it will drive advertising revenue and return on investment for, for the studio. Um, I have never seen a, a, a training game that didn't, or, or any sort of training that didn't sort of make me tense up because, oh my god, I'm going to take a, I have to take a test. With Jeopardy, I think the familiarity of the format breaks down those barriers. So when you're playing um, a, a, a training arcade version or the game agency version of, of Jeopardy, uh, you already know what it's going to be about. You already know, you certainly know the subject matter, and you know you're going to play a game. It's a game, and you're going to be engaged in that game. And I think it, it makes people more open to learning and to engaging and to wanting to participate. That 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 makes a lot of sense. We and, and just you know to to kind of talk uh, in on, on top of that, uh, we often talk about passive learning versus active learning, right? And at the end of the day, um, there are a few uh, things that are more active than actually a game environment. Um, it is it is the um, the the game that we all kind of played along with at home from our couches, right? So um, maybe we could talk about um, in your in your mind um, what makes Jeopardy, uh, you know, beyond just being a fun game, what makes it certainly so beneficial for employee training um, and and for knowledge assessment as well. So both sure. of those. Well, well, there's that that natural interactivity. Any other form of programming that you might might watch, um, drama, comedy, you know, they're all successful shows but you walk into a room where Jeopardy's on the screen, you are going to be engaged. You're going to be drawn into the program, and by God, whether you like it or not, you're going to stick around. Um, the, the other part of it is that it is, um, has become very popular for what's now become known as co-viewing. We just used to call it family viewing, but it's something that people can engage with as they're watching together, um, and again, you may uh, you may learn something, and 
one of the wonderful trends that now we're seeing is that with Jeopardy, it's cool to be smart. And it can also be very profitable to be smart. But people are also coming away with um, uh, what, what I guess used to be known as sort of uh, a water cooler uh, conversation. Hey, you know what I heard on Jeopardy last night? You know what I learned on Jeopardy last night? So our, um, we're, we're finding that people are, are learning, but we don't have to call it that because that sounds so clinical. That sounds like it's too educational, but people are coming away with more knowledge and more understanding, and they also want to come back for more the next time because now they know how the game works. Uh, and and I, I assume they're also seeing, and this is, this is part of the, 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 the family viewing experience, both a uh, competitive as well as a collaborative experience um, through, through, through the game. Is that a fair statement? Oh, very much so. Very, very much so. We, we know of people who live, you know, thousands of miles apart, but they will, they will watch um, an episode of, of Jeopardy together by, you know, staying on the phone or, or either, you know, texting each other. And so it's, um, yes, it, it's very, very much a shared experience. And certainly now with social media, uh, it's brought a lot of viewers back to the show who might otherwise have become lapsed viewers. So again, there's that, there's that interactivity now that people are familiar with seeing Jeopardy not only on their TVs, but on their personal screens and on all of their mobile devices, all their smartphones and so on. So again, it, it's a very, very friendly, welcoming, familiar environment that um, I, I think promotes learning. So, so with that in mind, it, the, the property's been around for 36 years. Um, as you know, people mentioned in the chat, um, there have certainly been a number of instances where people have tried to create their own via PowerPoint. Um, uh, I'm curious, what made you guys decide over at Sony that it was time to uh, a uh, bring something to the market that you know uh, your, yourselves or with a partner, and, and b um, to take your brand, which is obviously a, a phenomenal brand, and put it into the hands of trainers, uh, instructional designers to create their own content. Um, can you talk a little about that? It really came down to um, the game agency spending the time and, and taking the effort to understand our viewers, understand uh, our brand, um, understand how to best mold that format uh, or actually establish a format in a way that it could be molded to any subject matter. And um, it, was, it was the first time we really felt like we could um, send our, put our, our, send our child off and, and it would be in, in good hands. Well, I appreciate that uh, very much. Um, I think we're going to, uh, first of all, if there are any questions specifically for um, Harry at this point, um, and, and or we can uh, go through some specific examples. Um, uh, so Gary, I don't know if you want to drive any questions or if we should just keep moving forward, you tell me. I think we give everybody a, an opportunity to enter any questions they have there in the chat. I, I'm current, kind of curious myself, what are some of the, the most common questions that Harry gets, uh, sort of universal questions that uh, that he always gets asked? Harry? <laughs> oh, gosh. I get asked um, whether or not the contestants have any advanced knowledge of the categories. They do not. Um, in order to get on the show, you first have to sign up and take our online test, which is administered a couple times a year. If you pass that, then your name is put into a pool. We draw from that pool, and we ask you to come in for an in-person uh, tryout, where you'll have to take another test. And if you pass that one, then we give you an opportunity to, um, to play the game in a, in a mock game setting. Because not only do you have to be smart, but you also have to be fast on that signaling button, which uh, uh, trips a lot of people up. But uh, and to have that combination of, of both skills and traits is um, we're, we're finding pretty rare. Well, that's great, and, and that's I guess to be expected uh, as well. You know, DK has a question uh, here and uh, says, "Is Jeopardy conducive to games beyond the level of information recall?" Do you have any thoughts about that? 
Um, I'm not sure exactly what what that means. Okay, uh, I I think uh, DK, if you can uh, go ahead and, and expand on that, and we can go ahead, Stephen, and uh, perhaps come back to Harry uh, once DK has a chance to uh, sort of clarify. Yeah, and Gary, I'll just I'll weigh in on one thing on that item um, or on that question. Harry may have an additional point of view, um, but you know when we designed um, uh, our, our version of Jeopardy, we wanted to make sure that it not only um, certainly assessed knowledge um, and certainly uh, assessed someone's ability to recall, but also uh, provided uh, some at least additional reinforcement of the information. So one of the things that we have is you can do pre-roll videos, you can do pre-roll uh, images, um, uh, which can basically educate somebody about something, um, but you also can put in reinforcement points, which I think is critical for any trainers, right? Um, and I think that that, that that combination is going to um, certainly play a role in slightly reinforcing uh, the information, as well as, to, to DK's point, uh, test someone's ability to, um, to recall that information. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to keep moving forward. Um, if there are additional questions that come in, we can certainly... Uh, ask them, but I want to just be uh, cognizant of time. I'm, I want to pass the baton really quickly over to um, uh, Michael and to James, uh, and maybe we can talk about some real examples um, of where, where they're using some of the games uh, and what games they're using, if we can. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. So my name is Mike Sidebottom, and I work for Comcast and specifically Comcast University. Um, and and I just want to note before we before I kind of dive in here, um, you know, you know, it was awesome to hear Harry speak about Jeopardy, and you know, I've watched the show for, I don't know, since I was probably five or six with my my grandma, and you know, someone as a former trainer who used to try to create and use like PowerPoint Jeopardy games, just these, uh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll be nice here, just but but not very good like you know representations of that game, um, as well as even the whiteboard version. You know, seeing Jeopardy and getting that experience inside the training arcade is really just an, an overall, you know, really awesome experience. Um, and we've had some some great feedback as we've actually deployed that game recently. So, um, a little bit about us. My guess is most of you guys are familiar with Comcast in some way, shape, or form. Um, you know, and it really the reason I want to tee up Comcast here is because you know we're a Fortune 50 company. We have well over 100,000 employees, you know, across the nation, across the globe. Um, and we support, uh, or rather, you know, within Comcast, we have a lot of brands, you know, NBC, Universal Studios, Sky, Xfinity. Um, and so working for Comcast University is, is really pretty amazing just in terms of how, how vast this organization is and um, just at the kind of the pace of innovation that it's moving at. And so our Comcast University group is, is really just a centralized L&D organization of about 500 people. Um, and we support all aspects of Comcast's cable business, um, as well as uh, some others. And really, the, the goal as, as Comcast University is to develop the, the most talented and engaged workforce that you know, drives a, a truly world-class customer experience, which we are, are really trying to strive to make our number one product. Um, and our overarching strategy behind this is really pretty straightforward. It's simple, easy, and digital. Um, and I'll, I'll circle back to that here in just a second. So as program managers for Comcast University, James and I uh, create training programs for teams that support our residential and uh, B2B customers with advanced data, voice, video products. Um, and we work with business partners in, in pretty standard ways, which I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with, to strategize, scope, design, develop, implement, um, basically manage the entire training program for both new and existing uh, you know, programs as well. And within that, you know, we have to be extremely agile uh, to, to really, you know, meet the challenge of supporting this, this massive organization, which is Comcast. Um, and again, just adapting to meet the, that accelerating pace of that innovation in itself is, is often, you know, kind of challenging. Um, but for us, it really means thinking mobile first, uh, introducing, you know, more gamification and game-based learning. Um, really starting to expand into to AR and VR worlds. Um, and also, you know, beyond all that, and kind of even a step back, is really just simplifying our technologies, integrating our technologies to, to make sure 
that our learning solutions really are just simple, easy, and digital. So why games? Um, you know, where do games fit in? And I, I'd say in probably the one of the easiest ways to speak about, you know, games really help us to stay agile and adapt to meet our, our learners where and how they want to be met. Um, and games can do that by just simply boosting engagement, um, adding fun into a training program, which, you know, sometimes uh, I, I know we're, we're not building training programs to be fun, but it's, it's a, an amazing experience when you can, you know, develop a training program that is, you know, that checks all the boxes in terms of making sure it's effective and impactful, but also at the end of the day is just, you know, fun and engaging for the learner that's in that room. Um, so we chose to partner with the Training Arcade um, really just because of their, their platform in general. I mean, it's, it's super easy to use. Uh, you get multiple game types and an intuitive interface. And, um, you, know, you know, Stephen touched on this earlier. Prior to the Training Arcade, you know, we had all probably had our hand in or at some point had tried to create, you know, a game or used a template from another authoring software that was out there. And it really is a challenge, especially, you know, especially if you aren't familiar with said authoring software. So, you know, the fact that we can get a SME or a business partner onboarded into the training arcade and, and literally have them creating games within, say, 15 minutes is a massive win for us, um, you know, especially as we, as we move forward and, and are, you know, trying to crowdsource some of these development efforts. Again, it's just a, a, an amazing platform with the, you know, high quality outputs and deployment options that we get with them. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of touch on a couple key areas that James and myself have used, Training Arcade and, and other games. Um, and yeah, again, I'd say all of them really just allow, uh, allow us to be flexible. Um, and so we, we really piloted Training Arcade about a year ago. And honestly, within probably 72 hours of getting the platform up and running, like we, we, we realized the value that it brings. Um, and as we shared it with our colleagues, it really just kind of caught like wildfire and all of a sudden, you know, we're using it across multiple colleges in our L&D organization and, and really starting to, again, really explore just the different ways we can integrate it in different use cases. So um, a couple, at least unique to me, um, you know, kind of very interesting use cases for Training Arcade is um, we've implemented these Training Arcade games into our self-directed and kind of our hybrid self-directed programs as a stopgap. And, and what I mean by that kind of stopgap is we can put games after a, an activity or a series of activities or modules, and we can allow learners who may be consuming content at a little bit slower pace to catch up and use those games to continue engaging maybe learners who have already completed that activity to do informal review, you know, keep them engaged, keep them learning. And, and it's actually worked very beautifully in, in our kind of hybrid, you know, ILT slash self-directed programs and also just our truly self-directed programs. Um, and we've also really, at least in um, my programs, I've, I've really gotten into a cadence of using these instructor-led game modes at the beginning of every day of a class. And um, as a former trainer, I started doing that um, a couple years ago. And it's, it's almost kind of funny how, how much people enjoy that. Like, honestly, my learners would would cry and riot and demand that we play a review game at the beginning of the day. And if we didn't, um, like there, there were serious consequences behind that. And so it really is even just a great way to kick off the day doing review of yesterday's content or, or just kind of diving into, you know, a warm up for, for, you know, what's upcoming just to kind of get everyone grounded and uh, prepared for uh, that day's content. So I want to go ahead and pass it off to my colleague, Mr. James Pappas, here to run through some of his use cases and uh, talk a little bit more about just, again, some of the value that we've realized from the Training Arcade. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. And I'm uh, really excited to be here uh, as part of this presentation. And as Michael said, uh, I'm, or as introduced, I work with Michael as well in supporting Comcast and Comcast University uh, in supporting our employees and delivering this really unique really fun method of content delivery. So as Michael shared, you can obviously hear that Training Arcade and the way that we deliver games is very flexible and that's a huge benefit of it. And before I jump into the, the different ways that we use training, 
I just want to reinforce and reevaluate and level set um, what exactly we're solving for as we use these games in our training. So we deliver games with targeted questions to reinforce our learning content. We use these games to drive learner engagement and interactivity through a gamified learning solution. And then we also use it to reinforce our content through a repeatable model that allows for a growth of catalog of games that can be utilized as just-in-time learning. So as Michael referenced, um, using the games as needed as a stopgap, as a reinforcement, um, to really enhance our learning and provide that break or a break in the knowledge, just a new way and engaging way to deliver our content uh, that's really proven to be successful so far. So going into that, and I'll touch a bit more on the different modalities of learning that we utilize, whether that be self-directed or instructor-led, as Michael touched on, just want to highlight, obviously, the Jeopardy game is, as uh, Mr. Friedman showed up um, and, and, and talked through and really did a great job explaining, and, and we all see how robust it is and how excellent it is to use in our training. We view Jeopardy as uh, a comprehensive reinforcement of our content within a given learning program or training. So we'll use um, other different types of training arcade games, whether that be a jump or match game, as more of an introductory introduction rather into our content. And then leading up and playing those games, when you get to a Jeopardy game, it's really that comprehensive reinforcement because it's really robust, it's really easy to play, very simple, but also super engaging. And so we've used it in that format and it's really proven to be a really big hit with our trainers um, and our employees and a model that we're gonna to continue to implement. So moving forward, uh, I did wanna to touch on the different modalities that we've been using on it, we've been using. So it's, as Michael touched upon, it's instructor-led, it's self-directed, and it's also in our group and huddle formats, which is also uh, leader-led. So to start off with our instructor-led training, um, this is uh, where we have programs that are in learning content where we have instructors obviously facilitating learning programs with a bunch of our employees. And a an ex specific example of how we implemented training arcade within our instructor-led format is uh, through for our business partners who are offshore, nearshore, and onshore business partners who support Comcast. Um, we implemented about 14 games, training arcade games within a five-week instructor-led program in a site in the Philippines. So, Obviously very exciting to see the global reach that this is having. Um, so we implemented these games and we targeted the content around our quality program, which just to give some context behind, focuses on a specific set of behaviors that we train our employees on to make our customer, to make the customer experience rather, a lot better and a lot more uh, concise in making sure that the customer experience is as fluid and as the best experience that our customers can have. So we implemented these games into our, our business partner site in the Philippines and had them within the first three weeks of this training to really get it started off, uh, to start off the training and really have it be an exciting and an impactful beginning of learning. And the feedback that we heard has been extremely positive uh, with learners expressing excitement over the unique engaging content, as well as an increased retention and application of our quality content throughout their learning journey. I think one of the biggest takeaways that we've had is seeing not only the engagement piece, which is really self-evident within this application, it's really our, how our learners and our employees are taking away this learning and applying it elsewhere. And that's really where the significant impact is being seen. Similar impact is being seen in our self-directed training, which as Michael touched upon, allows for our learners to take their learning at a more self-paced environment. Um, and similar to how, uh, what Michael prefaced with, um, it allows our learners, you know, if learners are going ahead of others, or if some learners are lagging behind, um, in, in some cases, or in you, most cases, those learners can retake these games, uh, reinforce the learning within those games that we deliver, and also foster that competitive spirit, which has also been a huge piece of feedback that we've gotten uh, as we've implemented this content. And then just to wrap up on the modality piece, in our huddle sessions, this is more of, I guess you could say, like a, an informal training as opposed to the instructor led or the self-directed training programs, which are obviously very formal and speak to a schedule. Um, the leader led huddles are more in this group format and similar, obviously, again, to what Michael referenced, having that, in, that uh, instructor led delivery of it where a trainer or a facilitator or a leader rather in this case 
would deliver a game and then use a prompt for our learners to, to, uh, to play the game. And in this group session, learners would be playing, let's say, a Jeopardy game. And it really, the environment within the huddle, you know, you're going through a whole day of content. Obviously, you're learning a lot of critical information. Um, and that, co that competition really shines through as the learners are going through uh, this huddle environment. And obviously, I've, I'm, the feedback that I'm getting and what's really exciting about it is that even though the modalities are different, we're seeing the same exact feedback of that it's, it's very well received, it's increasing our knowledge, retention, and application, and our learners want more. And that's something that we keep hearing is like, when's the next game, when's the next game? So it's really, really exciting. So going off of uh, some specific examples of the different modalities that we've implemented, um, why we like using Training Arcade, um, and I've touched on this a bit as well as has Michael. It's encouraging that engagement and interactivity. It's fostering that competition among our learners. It's increasing knowledge retention application. And again, providing that unique content delivery method. Um, and in addition to this, it's the fact that just gamification as a whole, it, games play into a learner's basic needs and they encourage ongoing engagement. You know, learners participate in gamified experiences for similar reasons. Challenges exciting and the validation of gaining points of doing better than you know uh, someone else in a certain game it gives you that sense of pride and uh, pride is really what it is in your work aside from the knowledge um, that you need to do to do your job successfully so it's really been for these reasons and more uh, training arcade has been a huge boost to our learning programs across all of our modalities and, and work streams and so just to wrap it up uh, future plans with training arcade. Uh, one of the game types that we are that we have available to us is that scenario game that we're going to utilize uh, within a branching uh, capacity. And what's really going to be awesome about this um, is that when we utilize a scenario-based game, it's going to allow us, at least within our purposes, to sample call clips. And what's going to be really unique about this uh, content delivery is that we can include sample call clips. And if a learner gets, you know, they'll hear a portion of a call clip, get a chance to to ask a question or answer a question rather of how they think the call will go moving forward. Based on how their answer, if they answer correctly, they'll move forward on the correct path, but the critical piece comes in of if they get it to answer incorrectly, they'll be able to hear how that conversation will go and they won't have to do it in a live customer environment. So what this will allow for is allowing our learners who take these scenario-based games to potentially avoid having these situations arise in real customer scenarios. And with real live customers, um, so it's really going to be a huge boost and increase the customer experience, which is really where we want to get to. So, and then obviously there's a continuation expansion of game-based learning that we're going to continue, Michael and I are going to continue to use across Comcast University as we move forward. So that's, as a whole, uh, what we've been doing here uh, for Comcast. Again, it's really been a huge benefit to our learning content, and uh, I'll pass back to uh, Stephen uh, for as we want to move forward, or any questions we want to field uh, for Michael or I. Or to, or to Gary, if we want to move forward, just want to check on next no, I see that, I, I see that, uh, that Stephen has come back in, and so I just need to boost him up to prepare him a little, uh, to promote him a little bit, and then he'll be able to uh, to do that. Uh, somebody had some questions uh, about seeing examples, by the way, and uh, somebody we're uh, preparing uh, possibly to be able to share some samples with you at the end of the webinar. Okay. And Stephen, you, can you, can you, there you go. Yeah, I sure can. Okay, super. So, um, th th my, Michael and uh, James, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, uh, so next up, uh, certainly, uh, Chris Christina Lorenzo um, has a very, very different story. And um, I, while while Comcast is obviously focused on a, a number of different stakeholders uh, on the learner side, um, Christina uh, and Chess, for that matter, are a, a little more focused on um, one audience, and, and Christina, I was hoping maybe you can talk a little about chess, certainly your role there, and and um, you know what what you're what you're focused on, certainly from a games uh, training standpoint. 
Yeah, absolutely, Stephen. I just wanted to say first off, thank you for having me and thank you Training Magazine Network and Gary for hosting today. So again, my name is Christina Lorenzo. I am a senior e-learning instructional designer at CHEST. CHEST is the American College of Chest Physicians. It's a bit of a mouthful, but what we are is a subspecialty medical society that focuses on three branches of medicine, pulmonary, sleep, and critical care medicine. We are both a community for doctors as well as a place for doctors to stay up to date on their education in chest medicine. With that, we offer many modalities of education, including live learning hands-on courses, uh, an annual meeting conference that's coming up next week, as well as online courses and games. And that's what gets into my role here at CHEST. I am an instructional designer that de designs and develops the, the games and the online courses with a team of two other instructional designers. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your learners overall. Um, uh, obviously, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a focused uh, uh, audience, but maybe, maybe you can help us understand who they are a little bit better. So Steve, it totally is a focused audience. They are doctors and allied health professionals. So if you think, if you've ever been a patient and, and go to the doctor, you know that their, uh, their primary focus is caring for their patients. Many of our chest doctors have very complex patients with complex journeys. They spend a lot of time entering information into medical charts. They also unfortunately have very long hours. They also do procedures and they're on call on the weekends. But conversely, they're high performers. Uh, they're, they're some of the top in the field. And um, with that, they, as a learner, they have short attention spans, and they really have less time for learning than they'd really like. And there is an exponential amount of medical information out there that they need to keep on top of to ensure that their patients get the best care. Um, but all of this really sometimes leads to stress and burnout within our field. So I, I do have a question. Um, you know, given that profile, um, they they ha are being pulled in a thousand directions, um, and they they have a lot of information that they're being asked to look at. Why game-based training versus other uh, modalities? Can you talk a little about that? Absolutely. So game-based training is an escape from this reality that I'm talking about, and in that re in that escape, they're able to have fun and engage in the content and kind of turn off everything else that's happening outside of it. It's also a safe place for them to practice and fail. We certainly want to make sure that they, they care for the, the patient in real life to the best of their ability. So we need them to have a place where they can experiment and try new things in a game space. Also, games are naturally designed to provide visual information, and so it goes into those du dual channels of processing information, which is excellent for them to, to be able to achieve, uh, to obtain more content in a shorter period of time. The games that we design are typically bite-sized in the amount of content that we offer. They're usually highly, highly specialized and focused content as well as uh, lasting about five to 10 minutes at a time. But we find that the games, the mechanics that we use, for example, the jump game, it's very addictive. So our learners come back to play again and again, uh, just cementing the knowledge that they're obtaining in these games. Finally, our games, both our games online, and oh, go ahead, Stephen. No, 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 keep going, sorry. My apologies, Christina. Yeah, so uh, the last thing I was going to mention is competition, because this is really important within this field of learners. So our doctors are naturally competitive. So as soon as we put a scoring system in our games, and we put a leaderboard, and we attach prizes to it, we are going to drive engagement in those games. So you know, there are a few um, things that you mentioned here that we hear from a lot of um, partners. Uh, one is certainly the bite-sized component, right? It, it, it's um, uh, something we all hear more and more is that everyone wants micro content. Um, also, the, the fact that it's competitive, um, we see that uh, as a result of it being bite-sized and uh, whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic uh, motivations, people are coming back more and more. Um, 
I, I one of the things I, I talk about a lot is that uh, with with the the average training session, it's pretty rare that someone comes back and says, "Gosh, I'd like to take that a few more times." Um, are you finding that with, uh, with with the games that people are proactively coming back, or that you that you are um, uh, or that that you are pushing them to come back? Can you talk a little about any uh, a particular examples um, of that? Absolutely, Stephen. So two examples that come to mind is one, thinking back to what Michael and James were talking about, they were mentioning learning that meets them when and where they want to learn. This is the case for our learners. And games that are on a mobile platform that are uh, sh shorter games can meet a doctor who's um, you know, in between caring for patients, walking up to a patient's bedside, and they need to practice a new technique or reinforce some information, they can jump into that game or that piece of training right there and then where they want to learn. Um, and then the competition, I have several examples <laughs> regarding the competitive nature because these games, you yeah, exactly, you wouldn't imagine that people would be spending hours playing them, but we get that. So specifically, I think back to our last annual meeting that we hosted, we had a learner who figured out the URL to one of our jump games in sleep medicine. He took the, the game home at night and played it on his own personal computer and to get the highest score. And so when we came back in the morning, we found that this, this learner had been engaged all night trying to get the highest score. And truly, it's because he's a high achiever, and it wasn't the, the, the prize that was attached to it. And that's really common, and that, you know, obviously we say that with our games, but I think that that's a common theme with games, period. As long as they're a compelling experience, you're going to get someone to spend a lot more time with your content, um, whether it's on their own time, uh, whether it's in the classroom, um, uh, it, it's, it's definitely a theme. Um, so you, you have obviously a lot of tools um, at your disposal. Um, we, we started working with you about, about a year uh, ago. Um, but we know that you've done a lot with games. I'm curious what you like about the training arcade um, and you know how you're using it most effectively. Yeah, so the training arcade, the first thing that comes to mind is that there is a variety of games. When we first went into the training arcade, maybe it was almost two years back um, before we started a partnership in customizing games, when we first started looking at the off-the-shelf ones, um, we immediately were attracted to them because, like I mentioned, we have a small team of instructional designers, so we don't have a lot of bandwidth for developing very uh, robust games from the ground up. And so these off-the-shelf ones allow for rapid development. I have a screenshot here that shows that you can make some simple modifications, um, just plugging in information for each question right there and so the development is super easy uh, also they're mobile uh, all the games are optimized uh, for mobile which is perfect for our doctors who are looking to play games on their phone versus sitting on a computer and um, finally we can see those internal results of what's happening just like with that that jump game and uh, we found out that morning we saw that that night that our learner had been in there all night playing and so we can we can watch internally and see what's happening and make adjustments we can pull questions out because uh, medical content is changing every few months and so we need to constantly be able to update and so the training arcade offers a place for us to rapidly develop um, and then be responsive to the results we're getting from the players. Can you, um, uh, and you and I have not actually talked about this as much, so I don't mean to put you on the spot, um, but it, because the slide showcases analytics, can you talk a little bit about analytics? How, are, how important are they to you as a trainer, and, and, and how are you um, using them, certainly as you think about uh, your, your training overall? Yeah, so the, the first thing that's uh, really important for us at CHEST is that our education is accredited which means that our doctors can, can, can get continuing medical education credits uh, to ensure they stay up to date and licensed. So with accreditation, we need to report out all the education that's happening, whether it's in a course or it's in a game. So having this dashboard at our fingertips allows us to export these numbers and share them with the accreditation council. Uh, and that's one of the uh, a really high priority for us. Another thing is looking at, um, like I mentioned, we can we can make changes on the fly. So we can go into those the RET dashboard and find out maybe one game is being more successful. If we're comparing two games uh, next to each other, we can look at the numbers. We can look at the the length, the average duration, how long they're spending in there. And so we can we can make decisions uh, which game we want to bring to a live session, um, which game we want to continue to build out. We can make changes just. Um, um, 
changes to our games just by comparing that data. And then finally, like I had mentioned, we talked about how medical information changes. Uh, sometimes the information doesn't change, but the questions change. So we find out that we wrote a bad question and that maybe everybody is getting the question right or everybody's getting the question wrong um, or they're spending way too much time on it. So we have an opportunity when we clean up our games, we have an opportunity to dive right into the dashboard and that helps us zoom in on where we should clean up our games. I, I, I think that's a really key point. Um, you know, one of the things that comes up, whether you're talking about uh, the branching dialogue or jump or back to Jeopardy, um, a lot of the games that people create on their own uh, really don't um, have that level of analytics. And I think, uh, you know, just it's our point of view over uh, at the game agency in the training arcade that it's important to think about that, that user knowledge as well as that user behavior and make sure that it is um, impacting your uh, overall training. So I just I encourage everyone to think about that um, uh, very much so. Um, I'm curious uh, if you can talk, so you've, you've mentioned obviously a few different games that you're, um, you've done. Um, if, if maybe you could talk about you know, which games you use for what, um, in particular uh, Dr. Neb, which we're showing here, is one that I know that um, our, our, our team has spent a lot of time with you guys on. Um, could you kind of give, maybe just give some examples? Yeah, absolutely. So examples, Jeopardy, of course. Jeopardy is something that we just got to play, the instructor-led version. We played it internally with our staff, and we love it. So I'm hoping that we're going to be able to roll it out soon in our live sessions. And I know that faculty, doctors uh, who, who teach, that they're going to be really interested in that. So I know that's kind of looking forward. Um, but Jeopardy, we've also, we also did a version of Jeopardy as well, um, uh, the one that's um, just directed by the learner themselves that's been successful. Uh, jump, we have many iterations of Jump. That one seems to be the most addictive so far. So we continue to put out different channels of content for the, that game. And then finally, Dr. Neb, which I'm going to dive into more. Dr. Neb, which stands for Nebulizer, is a customized game using the scenarios template. So about maybe a year back, we we had uh, come across this new content, so there was new information out there on uh, COPD, uh, which is a lung disease treatment. And we could either give the doctors a 20-page guideline pamphlet and say, read this pamphlet and then go out and apply it on your patients. Or we could engage them in a game over a series of different cases and, and see how they react to that and if they're able to absorb the information uh, better. So we looked, we we knew that we needed to, to have something that was more engaging um, than just a jump game, for example. So jump, we don't have a journey. There's no progression because it randomly goes from one question to the next. Um, for the scenarios game, it automatically felt like a good fit because it was going to be continuous. And we wanted to match the, the actual patient journey that would be continuous as well. I appreciate that. I'm uh, I'm curious. Can you talk certainly about um, branching paths overall? Because uh, that's obviously what you've used uh, Dr. Neb for. Um, uh, what's that experience been like, and um, how are you how are you using branching paths uh, from an educational standpoint? Yeah, this is a really important question, Stephen. So for all of the listeners out there, if you haven't gone into the Trainee Arcade. Um, when you do, you'll find out that scenarios, when you get in there, you're going to find out scenarios is going to take a little bit more time for developing, um, but the reward is going to be great. So there was a question, uh, I think DK had a question, and I think about, you know, Jeopardy, if that would be the best used um, game for this, but I think scenarios might be the answer for you. And uh, the reason is because scenarios allows to, um, for soft skills, for deductive reasoning, uh, communication skills, you have a series of scenes that get played, and then the learner is prompted to answer a question that drives from one scene to the next. And so they're building upon their learning as they go, and then they get to see the consequences of their answer choices. Um, as well, this kind of mimics, simu this, this has a very simulation feel to it, so it's mimicking an actual patient case and a patient story. And the content that we use to create Dr. Neb was actual content that the doctors in the field commonly see and they were thinking and calling upon their memories of interacting with patients when they built this out. And then finally some of those gamification features we attached to it was the scoring uh, to, to help drive kind of 
to, to cue the learner that they were going down the right path or the wrong path. And then it was important that we customized it and we added rationales because it's really important for our doctors to know when they answer, when they choose an answer that's not ideal, they need to know the, the rationale, the evidence-based rationale, um, why that wasn't the right answer. Uh, so one of the questions, Christine, I see pop up uh, is by Ken. He's asking certainly um, if Dr. Neb uh, is more narrative, or more of a game. Um, you know, I I'll give my point of view, and I would love you to um, give yours as well. Um, I think it's a combination. Uh, it, by all means, is uh, very much puts you into the user experience uh, and have has you uh, trying out different techniques. But it has a few things that I, I think are certainly game related, right? It's going to have a, a, a toggle of, of sorts, which will give you a sense as to your performance. Are you, um, you know, are you are you progressing? Uh, to where you need to go, or, or are you going further and further away? It has a point system as well, um, uh, and, and it has feedback along the way. And I think that all those uh, really make it uh, more of a simulation game, which if you think about uh, some, some of the popular simulations out there, um, those use just the exact same techniques. But I'm hoping maybe you, from your point of view, if you could kind of answer that question as well. Yeah, I'm in agreement with you that it's a mix of both. So it definitely has, the, it's case-based first, which is what our learners need. Um, so, but it does have that scoring system involved with it. Now we had to kind of fudge the scoring system. There's really no right or wrong answer. So it was what was the best choice versus the least best choice um, had different scoring attached to it. But I think where we tried to, to play up the gaming was that these the experience was very immersive. Um, we had custom art design that was very engaging. We used character art. Uh, we used, um, our script has some really funny things sprinkled into it. And I think because the doctors who helped us create the content were in the mindset that this was a game, they, they kind of, um, you know, they took down their, their armor and their very professional nature and they, they kind of were like, okay, let's make this a game, let's make this fun. And b by automatically thinking, hey, we're building a game, the doctors who built the content were able to shift into that, that mindset and make sure that it was, it was fun and engaging. And so I think that it, it kind of, which came first, whether it became a game or it started out as a game and became more simulation, that, that's really blended. So I see that uh, M.M. asked a really important question as if she was cued to do so or he or she was cued to do so. <laughs> um, the question is, do you let them go down the wrong path or do you correct them right, right, right away? There's obviously many ways of approaching this. Can you talk certainly about the logic that you guys have to taken uh, with, with the branch for this game? And certainly I can add in on what others are doing as well. Absolutely. So uh, to M.M.'s point about letting them go down the wrong path, um, we do let them go down the wrong path, but then we put them back on the right path. And the way we do that is by choosing the logic called branching, uh, parallel branching. So in true branching, we start out with like an analogy of a tree and it has the branches and there's these infinite possibilities of endings and it's very nonlinear, it's exploratory, it's choose your own adventure. Um, but as you know, if you're a small team, uh, you don't have the production resources to build a, tr a true branching game. So instead, you choose parallel branching. And that's one reason to choose it. And the other one is, is because of MM's question. Um, because yes, we let them go down the wrong path, but we want to ensure that they ultimately land on the, the key learning points. So if you can see in this diagram, uh, this, this is a kind of an interpretation of what parallel branching is. So we start out at A, and then there are these three parallel branches. There's B, C, and D. And the learner can choose to go down B, C, or D, and then they're all in parallel. So let's say B was the best choice to go down. Um, they're still going to end up at E, the same if, you, if the learner went down D and that was really not the best choice. And they're going to end up at E as well. And then at that point, that's where information is going to be reinforced um, about kind of recapping what was important and what happened with the patient. And we designed the script around that to make sure that the script wraps up and then hits that point E. So maybe, for example, you gave the patient medication B, or you gave the patient, um, you assigned them pulmonary rehab, you might find out that the consequences were ultimately the same and the patient's coming back for another follow-up visit because they were progressing worse. Um, so in this way, it helps, it helps ensure the patients who go down the wrong path 
um, hit those teaching points. It also helps with us writing scripts to make sure that our scripts don't become endlessly complicated and it, it keeps everything simplified. It's worth mentioning, um, MM, uh, you, you asked certainly, can you? So, mm -hmm. Uh, Stephen, uh, were you speaking up? We couldn't quite hear you. What? You can't. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know if you can hear me now, but uh, MM, to answer your question, and, and I'm sorry, audio is popping in and out for me, but um, you, you can reverse decisions. Um, you can, sorry, I should say you can't reverse decisions, but you can, from a path design standpoint, you can write the path to go any way, shape, or form. Um, I happen to really like the logic uh, that Christina and her team took with this, but the, the, the tool itself is incredibly flexible in allowing you to design it to allow uh, the, the learner to go any way that they want. Um, so I, I think we have maybe two or three more slides. Um, uh, Christine, I was wondering if maybe you can just talk super quickly about um, success, and this goes back to analytics. Um, you know, what, sure. what was success well, for you guys? Well, the and success, you, we launched the game in about, uh, April. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit so faster for the sake of time who, for everyone dropping off. But we launched in April. Um, we added, uh, during the soft launch, we had an iPad and asked some questions directly to learners. Um, we found out that, yes, they, they strongly agree and agree that game-based uh, learning is preferred over lecture-based. Um, that was really happy to hear uh, from our doctors. And also, the overall rating, they, they evaluate Dr. Neb to be both above average and some excellent. Um, so overall, there was a really positive uptake of Dr. Neb, which was, which was good for us. Um, but they did give us some critical feedback on ways to make changes, and we're always looking to be innovative and update our content. Um, so we, we took back some pointers, um, you know, add some voiceover to it. Even if they're on mobile phones, they would prefer that. So there's different things we could do to continue to improve it. But I think overall, it was a success, and we're hoping, um, we're hoping to continue to expand it. Our audience for the moment was just for doctors, but I would love to expand it to allied health professionals. Uh, respiratory therapists are really big in the world of COPD care, and so they're their ability to engage in this material as well is very important for ensuring the patient gets the best care. So uh, I'm, I'm going to do this one last slide, and then we need to do a real wrap-up real quick. Yeah, so um, in addition so to expanding out with Dr. Neb, like we're shows. hoping to uh, have a centralized location where all of our learners can come and uh, play together and compete online. Uh, I think that this would be an extremely valuable uh, way to engage our learners all year round. Uh, so I, I will we'll certainly go into that in more detail. Um, that that is something that uh, we're working on with um, Chest and, and a few of the clients, which is uh, and, and actually Comcast as well, uh, which is a, a hub for people to play. Um, I do want to make you guys aware of uh, an offer for everyone who's attended this. Um, anyone who wants to do a trial of the Training Arcade and ultimately wants to um, use the Training Arcade uh, for life, um, we have a, a promo code that really uh, allows you to get the eight games, um, but also gives you um, uh, an unlimited number of admins for as long as you're uh, using the platform. Um, so that is a pretty substantial um, uh, value. Uh, I, please feel free to use this code and or um, uh, send us any questions that you have. Um, but I'm going to move this back over to Gary. Well, and thank you very thank much, Stephen, and, and Harry, and um, Christina, and uh, Mike, and uh, everybody offline, that's been involved. That uh, thanks so much for putting this together, and thanks for uh, to all of you who have attended. Uh, if you folks have a few minutes, if our, our participants, our members have a few minutes, um, actually, Christina has agreed to do a little bit of a kind of an impromptu uh, uh, demo. Uh, Christina, are, you, are we still uh, of a mind to do that? Oh, absolutely. Based upon the questions here, I think that, that I'll be able to answer some more of them if we take a deep dive into Dr. Neb. Great. Well, I, I'm going to do something here we didn't prepare for, so uh, if it goes south on us, well, uh, then everybody uh -huh. will understand. But we'll go ahead and add another pod here, and Christine, I'll just uh, walk you through this. Even though we didn't test, uh, it should be uh, uh, 
there shouldn't be a reason why this wouldn't work for you. So we're just going to show your desktop. And if you want to click the share my screen, and now you need to click another thing that says uh, start sharing. Did you click the second thing? I did. One moment. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, good. We can all see that. And just a, a note for everybody, if you look up in the upper right-hand corner of that pod there, you'll see four arrows that are going uh, away from the center, right? If you click that, that'll make it full screen for you. You're welcome uh, to do that. And then you just click the same uh, the same icon uh, when Christina is done to bring it back to the state that it's in now. So, Christina, go right ahead. Okay. And, Gary, you're going to guide me when I'm ready to exit, right? And you're going to sure. prompt if there are questions that come up? Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so here, here's the introduction slide. Um, this is one of the scene three of four different scenes across this patient journey and Dr. Neb. Um, there's some over, overview here of what's happening in the scenarios template. So we have the, the meter, the clarity meter. We have the history. They can actually track what's happened. Um, this is really important for our doctors to ensure that they can uh, see what what choices they made and why they got there, and then the continue button, of course. Here's a little introduction. Dr. Mendez, he's going to meet this patient for the first time. Uh, we we went with the comic book uh, style for this game, and and that's mostly one to add some personality to all of our our patients and characters and doctors. Um, the second is because this is this is kind of a text heavy game, um, which you'll find. And and so the, the text bubbles and the dynamic um, the dynamicness of text is is difficult to to achieve and so by using the comic style help add more of that. So they're having a pretty typical conversation. Go ahead, Stephen. Was that you? No, that was me. But I didn't have anything. No, to no, say. not me. So, Stephen, I don't know if you want to, you know, elaborate a little bit on, um, you know, any any of the choices as well that you had seen your team on your end when we did this partnership. Um, but feel free to add in. Yeah, well, I, I will say that you have a few options when using um, scenarios. You can do what uh, Chess has done here, which is to build um, custom animations. You can also um, use other products out there that have uh, more off the shelf, whether it's uh, you know products like Beyond or Powtoon. You can work with uh, you know some of the templates that eLearning Brothers has. Um, you know whether it be uh, for stock you know, more stock images. Uh, images. Um, there's a lot of r r uh, options here. You can do um, video. I really love the design that they did here, and I think that it is um, it, it feels very um, inviting and uh, certainly uh, it keeps people engaged. Yeah, and so here we're at a point where, we're, where the learner is able to make a decision. Now, this one's a bit of a doozy, and so when you look through the choices, some of them are clearly more right than others. Um, we could choose the wrong one. No, I'm not sure whether the respiratory therapist was measuring your oxygen. Clearly the wrong choice, but then this is going to trigger the, so we have a rationale that pops up here. It's never appropriate to not measure. <laughs> it's just letting you know, hey, don't forget that. Um, here they're going to move on. They're going to reiterate this text. We had gone back and forth in the design thinking about how we wanted to, um, how much how much of the content we wanted to reinforce and replay and how much we wanted to cut back. Um, but we thought it was still important for the, the character, for the choice to be put back into the character's mouth. And then here they're just going to start going, they're going to start going down a conversation path uh, once they get into here. It's, it's going to start to branch. Now, I don't know how much further we're going to go to the point where we're going to hit a point where there's a key shared uh, decision. But we also, there was a question before that asked if there's kind of any going in reverse. And yes, the way we did reverse was that we had some of these questions. I'm going to click through. Some of these questions actually would trigger, when they clicked it, it would trigger them to go back down a different path. And so when you're in the development side of this, um, which I'm looking at today, 
would you be able to pick exactly where, when they click on this specific answer choice, where this would bring them? And it could bring them onto a different path or even back to the beginning. So that's pretty much it for, for showing um, you know, a little snippet of what we did with Dr. Neb and how we transformed it into our own customized uh, game that was truly uh, patient story based. Gary, I think I'm done sharing my screen here. Okay, great. Uh, you can, I, I will actually stop it for you and so you don't have to worry about that. And uh, we do have a question by WLF. Oh, I'm sorry, Stephen, go ahead. Oh, no, we're on the same page. I was just about to answer that. So, yeah, the nice thing is whether whether it is uh, in scenarios or it is any of the other games, we're tracking a tremendous amount of data on the user. So, um, not only completion and what their scores are, but how they're answering every single question. Um, if they're answering it many times, how, you know what what how they're answering each go round. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of data um, which we're tracking. Uh, it's available. Um, certainly, uh, what what can be transferred uh, via SCORM or XAPI, we transfer that way. Um, we also have an analytics dashboard, uh, which you can export any data um, in any format, a CSV, a Excel, so on. Okay, and now, Stephen, there's another question there, too. I don't know if you saw that from Sharon. Uh, and she wanted to know, or not, I'm sorry, it's from WLF again, can Training Arcade be integrated with existing LMSs? It can. So uh, there are a number of ways. Um, we do support a, a number of SCORM packages, so you can certainly um, export any game as a you know, SCORM package and just plug it right into your platform. Um, if you are building a course in any of the major authoring tools, you can embed it into those authoring tools as a web object. Um, we also allow for web, uh, web embeds. Um, so there's an uh, embed code that you can do. We basically tried to make this as plug and play as possible, uh, and it plays really nicely with really only a any LMS out there. Uh, the, uh, the last question is whether we can show the jump game. You know what I will do is, um, uh, if people want to stay, I'm happy to do that, or Jen, do you want to just grab one and we can put it in here as an example? Um, but. Uh, we can certainly show that as well. Gary, yeah, we're, we're running out of time, but, uh, but because we have another webinar to do. But uh, do you have a link to it that you can put in the chat, or is this something you want to do a screen share on? We can sure do that. So, um, oh, there. Asking, oh, there we go. So uh, here's an example. Of Here's an example of a jump game. I encourage people to come to the website. You can, it, we have examples of all eight games that are in here. Uh, someone asked earlier how many games there are. There are eight now. We have a ninth coming out, and we have a road and I'll, I'll go ahead and come. So def definitely. And Stephen, I'll go ahead and launch the uh, the page for Training Arcade on everybody's desktop to make it that much easier to get there. Or you can just go to trainingarcade.com if uh, if for some reason that's blocked for you all. Uh, what else do we need to cover, Stephen, before we wrap it up? No, I, I think we've uh, uh, really hit a lot of the points. Um, certainly uh, encourage you guys to play around with the tool, um, and I really appreciate everyone's time. And if there are any questions, uh, the tool side, if there are any questions that you guys are thinking about, how, what's the best uh, strategy based on different learning or performance objectives? What's the best thing for you to do as you're playing with uh, game creation, either in our tool or others? We're always happy to answer it. Um, we, we love this stuff, and uh, certainly would love the opportunity to. And Stephen, I've gone ahead and put your email address there on the screen, along with uh, along with your slide. So, uh, so I think uh, that we've pretty much answered all the questions and, and gotten a lot of great information today. Uh, encourage everybody to go to uh, the trainingarcade.com, and I would go there before you vote for the uh, training uh, magazine network. Choice Awards, you might find that the Training Arcade uh, is one of your favorite solution providers. So, uh, so uh, please do that, and then do vote. Uh, you have until the end of October. So, thank you to, uh, to Training Arcade and the Game Agency, and to all of our speakers, and to Jennifer especially for all her great help in pulling this together. Uh, any final words, Stephen? Well, just thank you very much to the Training Magazine. We appreciate you guys hosting us and appreciate everyone attending. Um, this is a You're welcome. So Enjoyed it. Everybody. Uh, thank you, Harry.